Well, Bush's first message to the country is perfectly clear. Kiss my Ashcroft. We all understand what that means. And then there's the presidential equivalent of the Masonic raising or the uh, bar mitzvah of the confirmation in the Catholic Church. He bombed Iraq. Every president has to bomb someplace in the last three presidents it's become a tradition to pick Iraq. I don't know why. Maybe they just threw a dart at a map and ran, okay, for the next three presidencies we start by bombing Iraq, then we move on to bombing other places that are more important to us or something. I don't know how they choose. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking, I guess we're all here now, or, or are we? Is there anybody here who isn't quite all here? Besides me, I mean. Can I get back to where you are sitting now? Well, I'm supposed to be talking about a new map of consciousness, which is really based on the eight circuits of the nervous system as described by Timothy Leary. Has anybody here ever heard of Timothy Leary? <laughs> well, I'll begin with the last conversation I ever had with Timothy Leary. For two years, everybody knew he was dying. He, I, he put a big sign over his door saying, uh, the mother of all parties. I invited everybody he ever knew to drop by and watch him die and enjoy, and enjoy the process. He, he made the death process into a game, an ecstatic sport, a lot of fun, chiefly with the aid of synthetic heroin, nitrous oxide, marijuana, morphine, cigarettes, and a lot of booze. <laughs> and, and, and plenty of congenial company and intelligent conversation. And so if any of you are planning to die of cancer soon, remember, remember how Leary handled it. Synthetic heroin, morphine, marijuana, nitrous oxide, booze, and lots of intelligent and humorous friends. Anyway, as I was leaving the last time I was there, knowing it might be the last time, not, not, not knowing how many days he had left, I said, Timothy, I want to tell you something. I've met Buckminster Fuller, and I still think you're the most intelligent person I've ever met. I've met George Carlin, and I still think you're the funniest person I ever met. Tim, you are wonderful. And he looked up at me and he said, Bob, you're a great judge of character. <laughs> <laughs> and off I went, and we never spoke again. And a month after his death. If you'd like, you can use this. Uh, anybody having any trouble hearing me? Yes. You mean most of you can't hear me and you haven't been complaining? Boy, what a, what a, what a crowd of saints and martyrs. Uh, Would you like to hold it? Well, no. Is it close no. enough now? No. Okay, everybody in the back who missed all the weary material, you can ask somebody in the front what the hell was. <laughs> I, I don't think I should do it all over again. And besides, I probably can't remember it. I, I have found a new way to get high and stay spaced out for hours and the government can't take it away from me. It's called senility. <laughs> <laughs> it has four major characteristics. The first is increase in long-term memory. I can, I can wheel myself from my computer room to my kitchen or walk on my walker. And all, on the way there, I can remember a fist fight I had with a kid named Billy Batson when I was in first grade, <laughs> which was 63 years ago. And I can remember what he looked like. I, I can remember the, the look on the face of the nun who tore us apart and told us no fighting was allowed in the schoolyard. I can, it all comes back. Then the second thing is decrease in short-term memory. <laughs> I get to the kitchen and I can't remember what I went to. <laughs> <laughs> And the third, uh, I forget what the third is. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth is, I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> Which is my version of an old Chinese proverb. The wise are Confucian in good times, Buddhist in bad times, and Taoist in old age. I think I'm old enough to be a Taoist now. And after years of uh, vehement and passionate study of the ideograms of the Tao Te Ching, I think I've summarized it all into a couple of words. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't fuck it, ignore it. It'll go away. <laughs>
Well, you know, you know why there are so many different translations of the Tao Te Ching because Chinese ideograms aren't like alphabetical languages. It's, to translate from any language to another is difficult, almost impossible. It's an Italian proverb, which I used to be able to say in Italian, but due to my increasing senility, I just forgot it, so I'll say it in English to translate is to betray. That's true from any Indo-European language to another. When you get outside the Indo-European framework and you start translating from the Chinese, you got a million possible alternatives of what kind of English. In the first place, the Chinese doesn't have the subject predicates for them. If you translate the way it, uh, the way the ideograms flow, you sound. Uh, don't take my water away. <laughs> <laughs> at the end, of, at the end of this, I'm, at the end of this, I'm going to do a high diving act. <laughs> <laughs> Some people think this really is water. <laughs> Where was I before they were trying to steal my water? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I never used to dare to try any Chinese in public for fear somebody would actually know some Chinese and correct me. I got very stoned at the Prophets Conference in Palm Springs, and I actually quoted some of the Chinese woman sitting at the table, and she said, say, your accent is quite, your accent is quite good. Hell, I, I thought my accent was absolutely abominable. Was this, uh, maybe she was overly polite. A lot of Orientals uh, do. It's part of their culture to be very, very polite. So maybe she was just humoring a crazy old man. But anyway, I, I take it maybe I, maybe my Chinese. So I'm going to give you a bit of the Tao Te Ching. Ren Fa Di Di Fa Tian Tian Fa Dao Dao Fa Tzu Ran. Now you, now you know everything you need to know about Zen Buddhism. <laughs> All you got to do is translate the ideograms, and I'll do them one at a time. Ren is the easiest one. It means humanity or people. Now we come to the hardest one, Fa. As a noun, it means a model or a copy or something a sculptor makes as a rough sketch, or it means what they use in casting metal, first they make the impress on on, so on uh, clay, and then they pour the metal in it, it takes the form of the impress, that's fa. But fa is also a rough draft of a statue, and it's also a process. You might say an actor fa, that means the actor is playing the role deeply. <coughs> so fa has so many meanings that to say, T means earth. So human beings, fa, earth, they're modeled by earth, or they are a model of earth, or earth is modeling them, or they're modeling earth. See why it's so hard to translate from the Chinese? You've got to get out of the subject predicate. I'm putting it all into the subject predicate form, but let's leave it out of the subject <coughs> predicate form and just say, humans model earth. No, you might take model as the verb there. Humans modeling earth. Okay, then this, in a second stanza was Ti Fa Tian, that's Earth Fa the Universe. Make up your own mind what Fa means <laughs> from the context. It, like I say, it's copying, modeling, faking, counterfeiting, uh, art, or just the influence of one thing on another. Now we come to the interest, to the most, the third line, which gets more interesting. Tian Fa Dao. The universe Fa Dao. What's Dao? Well, sometimes translated the way, sometimes the path, sometimes nature, sometimes nature's way, sometimes nature's process. Ezra Pound translates it the process. So, so far we got humanity shaped by earth, earth shaped by universe, universe shaped by the process. Well, the universe is not a static thing, but something that's evolving and growing and changing all the time. And now we get to the real killer, fa, Dao Fa Tzu Ran. Dao is some kind of intelligent movement, by the way. It's got the ideogram for intelligence and the ideogram for moving feet in it, so it's moving intelligence. By the way, I should have told you that right away, shouldn't I? That would help you, <laughs> the Dao. The, uh, the Fa is the kind of model you use in metalworking. That's what it was in prime early 
previous, uh, way back at the dawn of Chinese history when the language was being formed. <coughs> now we come to Su Ran. Su is easy. It means self or a person or the one you're talking to. Or it can mean somebody you're honoring, like Kung Fu Tzu, Lao Tzu, Mang Tzu, etc. Ran is, I give up on Ran. I should. <laughs> 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 well, Alan Watts translates Su Ran as self such, if that helps you in any way. I think the best translation is Dao Fa Su Ran. The Dao just happened. <coughs> Dao happened. Dao happens, shit happens. You ever, know, you ever know, you never see a shit happens bumper sticker on the back of a Rolls Royce? <laughs> <laughs> well, Rita, <laughs> I, I have been illustrating a simple principle of neuro-linguistic programming. The language you speak influ tremendously influences, some would even say determines your perceptions. You just can't... Uh, perceive outside your the language structure you're familiar with until you get pretty until you get the third joint goes around the room. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I I've been fascinated by psychology since I was in my teens. Like most teenagers who get interested in psychology, I was trying to decide solve a major problem. Why am I so fucked up? <laughs> uh, that's, that's one thing you can, you go to any college and you look at the psych majors and you look at the rest of the students and obviously the psych majors are the ones who look obviously like they're well fucked up. <laughs> that's why they're, they're trying to find out in psychology, how did I get fucked up and is there any way to get unfucked? <laughs> now, I've been working on it for over 50 years now and I seem to be still all fucked up. <laughs> But now I'm making a living from it. <laughs> anyway, in all the psychology I've read, I think the best model of the human brain is in the later works of Timothy Leary in the 70s and early 80s after he got out of prison. He made some very important discoveries in the 60s, which I think will be, if we ever have a free scientific community again with free research and all those things that were so bitterly fought for in the Renaissance, if they ever come back again and the Inquisition goes away, you know, there's a part, it's, Alan Watts told me the worst error of historians is their belief that the Roman Empire fell. <laughs> it never fell. It still controls the Western world through the Mafia and the Vatican. And it's taken me about 30 years to realize how accurate that judgment of Alan's was. And the other major error of historians, I forget, <laughs> well, moving onward, <laughs> you know, from now on, I'm not going to let anybody persuade me to have any marijuana before I do a speech. <laughs> It tends to produce even more hilarious laughter on the part of the speaker than the part of the audience. <laughs> and the flow, of, the flow is not quite even. But then again, well, the flow of my presentation never has been quite even. Anyway, in, in uh, my study of psychology, I think the best map I found is Timothy Leary's. And uh, this divides the brain and the whole nervous system. You can't separate the brain from the nervous system. The brain gets messages from all over the body. There's one writer, Ernest Lawrence Rossi, in the books, The Psychology of Mind, Body, Healing, a very good book on how faith healing and cursing work. If you want, if you, if you, well, they both work on the same principles, you know. <laughs> The, he uses the term brain body, one word without even a hyphen in it. Einstein revolutionized physics by joining space and time into space hyphen time. And now when physicists are forced by circumstances or problems they're facing to have to refer to either space or time alone, they put space in quotation marks, space in quotation marks hyphen like, space like intervals and time in quotation marks like intervals because the space-time continuum makes much more sense than trying to divide them into space and time. The, Lawrence 
Rossi proposes, instead of thinking about mind, then body, we think about the brain body and we think of how the different circuits in the brain body work together. That's just what Leary was doing back in the 70s. Now you all know how the carpet tastes. <laughs> you, you, you all know what this kind of slipper tastes like. You, you know how the flowers and the pot, uh, we must have some flowers around here. You know how, they, you know how those flowers up there taste. You know, you know how the dirt in the flower pot tastes. You know all those things. You've forgotten most of them, but you, you, you spent the first several months of your life crawling around, uh, tasting everything. And your parents, the, the parents are human beings suffering from a form of mental illness that makes them believe they know how to raise a child. <laughs> I was one four times over, which is why I don't trust myself at all. <laughs> Being a parent consists of running around after them saying, don't put that in your mouth, don't put that in your mouth, don't put that in your mouth. <laughs> and, you know, th th then we get a president, everybody's going around saying, don't put that in your mouth. <laughs> 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 See that right? Well, the problem is there are two types of things in the world from the point of view of the very small brain of the amoeba, the reptile, the fish, or the newborn infant, the noxious and the predatory. No, I mean the, the noxious and the predatory on one side and the nourishing on the other. Let's put the noxious and predatory into one category to make it easier, just call them the hurtful or dangerous and the nourishing. So the first job of the newborn of any species is to no locate the source, source of nourishment. In all mammals, this is the mother. Hey, do we sound like Sigmund Freud here? <laughs> well, a little bit, but... <laughs> Leary calls this the oral bio-survival circuit. It wants to hook itself to a tit, and it wants to be sung to and hugged, and it wants, above all, to be fed regularly, because all infants are born naked, hungry, and intensely curious. So it begins to expand its idea of safe space away from mother to various distances away. But it knows if it goes too far, it might lose contact with mother entirely and never eat again. So the world gets divided up into safe space and dangerous space. And even if the mother is with it, sometimes a place that looks too strange will scare the living hell out of a small infant. They'll scream and howl, you know, it's because nothing looks familiar. And then they'll start the great infant mantra, which is the origin of uh, most of the sacred mantras of India. Oh, mommy, take me home. Oh, mommy, take me home. And this, is be this is because it takes a long time to get used to how many noxious and dangerous things there are, especially if you get the fascinating idea of getting something into the socket of the wall, the bottom of the wall there, which is as high as you can reach at that age. And you finally do manage to get something in there, and something terrible happens, and you see smoke coming out of your ears, <laughs> and your parents are having heart attacks and screaming, and somebody's trying to dial 911, and they keep getting 411, and you're lying there, and, wow, what the? So you to realize this is a dangerous planet we got born on. This is a dangerous <laughs> universe. So you've got to be very careful to distinguish safe space from unsafe space. And these are the basic parameters of the bio, the infant bio survival cycle, which we all still have in us. That's part of our brain. Every time we turn the corner, the infant bio survival cycle goes on. Is this safe or is it dangerous? Is this going to eat me or should I eat it? And that's why we have so many food taboos. I have a book I keep on the coffee table in my living room for all my visitors, just in case a vegetarian wanders in. It's called Oral Sadism and the Vegetarian Personality. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it argues that everybody has a sadistic component. The people who hunt animals and kill them and eat them, they're getting rid of their sadistic component in the natural way. The reason violence was built into a lot of animal species. Vegetarians repress their sadistic component, then they let out in the most cowardly form possible by attacking vegetables that can't fight back and, can't even, <laughs> and they can't even run away. <laughs> I'm, I'm arranging to have a new cover put on this book, so the author's name will be Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I think this will give the vet everybody draws the line somewhere else, you know. I know people who will eat fish, but they won't eat. Uh, post uh, Piscean, anything from post Piscean evolution. 
Well, they don't like reptiles. Nobody likes reptiles because they look ugly. We think if an animal looks ugly, we wouldn't like eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but they. <laughs> then there are those who will eat fish and chicken, but they won't eat the higher mammals like cows and pigs and so on, which remind us of our relatives all too uncomfortably. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, and then there are those who will eat anything except human flesh. <laughs> They'll even eat chimpanzees. People in Africa eat chimpanzees, which look a lot like human beings, but still they go right ahead and eat them anyway. And then there's Hannibal Lecter, who draws the line at a site. He, he will eat anything that looks tasty and seriously pisses him off. <laughs> the, way to have a long, the way to have a long and happy friendship with Hannibal is never to seriously piss him off. Ask Clarice Starling. It works for her. It works for Barney, the orderly. Just don't seriously piss him off. He draws, we all have our own set of food taboos, and Hannibal violates almost everybody's. But he doesn't give a fuck. He's old enough to be a Taoist, you say. <laughs> <laughs> There's a well known psychological medicine, measuring device called the F scale, which measures your tendency to be how much you have in common with members of the fascist party in Italy and the Nazi party in Germany back in the dark ages when I was young. And uh, this F scale is usually hidden inside a longer test to make it harder for the students to realize what's being measured. One of the traits of that shows a high coral that correlates with a Nazi-like personality is extreme anxiety about exotic foods, <laughs> the fear of eating something that you haven't tried before. And that usually goes along with liking, disliking foreign ideas, foreign art, foreign <coughs> movies even. And it builds up to a crescendo of, well, I had an uncle who not only hated blacks and Jews and all the usual minorities, he hated squirrels too. He called them tree rats. <laughs> 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 and you hate a group, you always make up a nasty name for them to reinforce your hatred. So you repeat the nasty name over and over again to reinforce your hatred. That's how you keep hatred going. The reason hatred is necessary is because without hatred we might get bored. <laughs> you see, we've got to have some emotions, and if you can't have joyous emotions, <laughs> and if you try to have a joyous emotion, you'll find any way, any possible way of feeling real ecstasy. The government has already passed a law against it. Joy is very much controlled. They're very much afraid of that, but they don't care how much you hate people. The worst you can do when hating people is kill them. They know what to do about that. They kill you. That's, that, uh, that's a lot of simple logic. One plus one equals zero. <laughs> if somebody commits a murder, then you commit a murder, and the total adds up to zero murders. Only sentimental humanists and secularists and agnostics and other heathens like that claim that one plus one equals two, and we don't need them. <laughs> I, I've already written to George Bush about this. It's the first of the Wilson Bush correspondence, which I'm going to be putting up on my website uh, for as long as he lasts. I refuse to believe he's going to last uh, four years. I mean, I, I have enough faith in good, honest, pa paranoid America, <laughs> American uh, people to believe somebody's going to shoot the son of a bitch oh. before <laughs> four years. Or either, that <laughs> either that or he's going to be impeached. You see, I'm an incorrigible optimist. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one thing I agree with him about. I never believed in owning guns until he, he got elected president. <laughs> and I thought we need all the guns we can get. Uh, anyway, there comes a point at which we begin to assert ourselves against gravity and struggle to stand up. I have a unique, Leary calls this the emotional territorial circuit. I have a very special and unique insight into that because <coughs> I learned to walk twice. I had polio twice and each time I recovered and learned to walk. Now I've got post-polio syndrome and I walk part of the time and ride around in a wheelchair part of the time which I don't find objectionable at all. It gives people a chance to exercise their kindness. It makes life, uh, it makes it easier to get from one place to another when I'm tired. <laughs> but I know the struggle against gravity. 
And most children have heard her do this at the top of a flight of stairs. <laughs> look, look, look what I can do, Mommy, look. And you've got to catch them before they come down. <laughs> this, this, this emotional territorial circuit has to do with achieving a position in the power structure. You find out we're social animals. We have, a power, we have a hierarchy, just like the chimpanzees that Reverend Stein was talking about uh, in here. Well, some of you must have heard Reverend Stein's inspirational talk, yeah. <laughs> well, we have a power hierarchy, so they've got to find out, uh, yeah, they gotta find out where they are in the power hierarchy. The only way to do this is by fighting back against authority, which leads to punishment. You find out who you can, who you can dominate and who you have to submit to, and depending on uh, the accidents of imprint vulnerability, you can imprint the timid personality that submits to everybody and is always afraid. You can imprint a personality that tries to dominate everybody, including your own parents, in which case you end up in a juvenile home by the time you're in your mid-teens and you grad then you go on to do postgraduate work at a place like Folsom, where you, <laughs> where you learn safe you learn safe cracking and how, how, how do you, and lock picking and sodomy and sadom and sadomasochism and all sorts of useful subjects like that if you intend to be a real rebel against society. And uh, so we've got this forward back of the oral biosurvival circuit. How far is it safe to explore? Those who do the most exploring almost always get reputations as liars or lunatics. Hey, you know what I saw on that new continent I found? I saw a bird so goddamn big it was taller than people, and it ran around, put, it heads, put its head in the sand whenever it heard a loud noise. Oh, yeah, tell that one to the <laughs> sparrows. I mean, you know, I, hey, I got this here device here. You can see spots on the sun. Take that and shove it up your ass, Galileo. The Bible says there aren't any spots on the sun. <laughs> it's, it's always dangerous to be too far ahead. On the other hand, if you're too far behind, you get lost eventually, and you're left like Emma Jean Coca asking, did I walk away from the May walk, or did the May walk walk away from me? So most people in print a position somewhere between overly innovative and overly conservative, and or they imprint the position as extreme as you can possibly get. And I spent a lot of time in psychiatry because not of their own, not of their own choosing, but because their neighbors or a court or somebody has ordered them to have therapy for me. So, and then you got the uh, forward back and you got the up and down. Now we're in two dimensional space. At this point we learn language and Euclidean geometry is implicit in the Indo European languages Euclid merely codified it and pretty soon we're in three dimensions. And we've got three circuits because the third circuit has to do with language. Now, many animals have languages or language-like behaviors to be very careful and not go too far. Uh, well, okay, animals are more like us than we care to admit, but in scientific circles, you see, Descartes proved that animals don't have souls, but people do. So this made it possible to do a lot of medical research on animals without feeling at all squeamish about it. So anybody who suggests animals think and feel like we do gets a reputation uh, as a crackpot, otherwise it would stop a lot of scientific research. So they got to insist that animals are machines. Anybody who's ever owned a dog knows he didn't own a machine, you know. But, well, science, like any other priesthood, requires you to accept its dogmas and reject all tendencies to heresy and doubt. And how did I get off into that digression? Well, anyway, we got uh, <laughs> we develop uh, either right hand dominance and left uh, left hemisphere, right hand and left brain, which gives us a great deal of variable fluency, and we can abstract on higher and higher levels. Dogs can communicate about what's going on right now, and so can rats. They can't talk about what could happen or what hasn't happened or what might happen. They can't make long-range plans because their language abilities don't go to higher levels of abstraction. Whereas human beings, because of a quarter of an inch of cortex and on the top of the brain, we can abstract indefinitely to higher and higher levels, which means that information accelerates faster and faster as humans pass knowledge on from one generation to another. Now, rats pass on information, but at a much slower rate. 
in uh, the last 400 years, the rat has been blamed for bubonic plague and numerous other inconveniences to human beings. There's been a plot to exterminate the rats. Genocide. Show them no mercy. There are now more rats than people on the planet, which is the more intelligent <laughs> species. But, but rats, have, rats have learned a few tricks, like if you find food too easily and you know there are people living there, don't eat it. Mm -hmm. Or take a nibble and go away and see if you're okay in a few hours. If you get a stomach ache, go back and pee on it so no other rat makes the same mistake <laughs> you made. <laughs> They're going to future, but they can't pass on knowledge about wise guys who stuff up rat holes with Brillo or steel wool or things like that. Uh, and they can't pass on long-range ideas like the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, theorem. Uh, and they don't, and nobody's yet heard of a rat producing anything comparable to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony <laughs> or Van Gogh's The Starry Sky. We can abstract into many different forms, arts, sciences, uh, magic, uh, religion, philosophy, and, and there's no end to it. And because we all have different imprints on the first three circuits, we all live in entirely different universes. This seems to be the hardest part of Leary's system to understand. Uh, it was, it was, Kozhipsky knew about it even before Leary. I call it the principle of neurological relativism. No two nervous systems apprehend exactly the same world. We don't even apprehend exactly the same room. On the most gross and obvious level, if I asked you all to make a drawing of the room in perspective according to the laws of classic Western art since Leonardo, you would all paint a different room because you're sitting in different places. But if I asked more subjective questions, you'd find just as many differences as there are in the perspectives. This is called perspectivism, and it's regarded as the worst danger of modern science and secular humanism and so on. There is no one true perspective. We approximate the truth by adding the number of perspectives we're able to handle. The more perspectives you can handle, the closer you come to processing information as rapidly as your computer <coughs> does, and, and unlike your computer, you can make decisions on the basis of inadequate data, on the basis of probabilities, which is very useful because the reason computers are so damn limited so far, they do everything so fast, that they do such wonders, but they can't make decisions on the basis of inadequate data. We can because we've learned how to calculate probabilities. They're beginning to use <coughs> fuzzy logic in computers. Fuzzy logic is based on probabilities. Once the computers can use fuzzy logic, they'll be smarter than us in all dimensions because they'll be able to make decisions on the basis of inadequate data. <laughs> what I call the jumping Jesus phenomenon derives from this third circuit abstracting on higher and higher levels, which is why the Chinese live in an entirely different universe than us. They've had 5,000 years to build up their reality tunnel based on ideogrammic thinking, and we've had 5,000 years to build up our reality tunnel based on alphabetical thinking. And uh, there's a very good book called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. Since we got a lot of goddess worshippers here, you, you really ought to read that book and see what a foul conspiracy <coughs> lies behind alphabetical thinking. <laughs> well, it's not exactly a foul conspiracy, but it's, if you can learn mathematics or a little Chinese, you'll suddenly begin to realize how limited all the Indo-European languages are and how they force us to say things that just ain't so because, they got, because we want to sound grammatical. And to sound grammatical is to distort nature, which is not broken down into subjects and predicates. But anyway, uh, the jumping Jesus phenomenon is based on a French statistician named Georges Andela who estimated the number of bytes of information available to humanity starting at the year of the birth, of, the alleged birth of, of Yeshua ben Yosef, whom the Goyim called Jesus Christ. You've heard of him? <laughs> that's a very Western chauvinist place to start, but unfortunately that's where Angela started. And he take all, took all the information available to humanity at that time and called it his first unit. 
since he didn't name the unit, I could have named it an Andola after him, but since he started from 1 AD, I decided to call it a Jesus. How long did it take to double and give us two Jesus? 1,500 years. Then we had Leonardo, Michelangelo, the Renaissance, the scientific revolution, the discovery, the, the, the binding together the global, the discovery of the unity of the globe and the fact that Europeans were ahead of everybody else so therefore they could rip off everybody else. <laughs> and uh, the next doubling only took 250 years and by 1750 everybody was talking about revolutions, scientific revolutions, intellectual revolutions, even political revolutions. And between 1750 and 1850, almost every monarchy in the world was either limited or abolished entirely. Um, we had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, two, two Mexican revolutions, several Bolivar-led revolutions in South America. We even had the first revolution in Vietnam in the 1790s. The whole world was, over, was overwhelmed by the flow of more rapid information and the new possibilities it opened up. We are now up to 1J, 2J, 4J. <coughs> By 1900 we had 8J and the world was changing faster than ever. My father was born shortly before 1900 he was the only one, uh, he was part of the generation, the only generation to ever live through a doubling of knowledge because knowledge doubled again by 1950. I mean information in terms of measurable bytes that you can calculate with a computer. Uh, the next doubling took 10 years, only in the 1960s were unleashed on us and we're still reeling from the 60s and we're still not entirely recovered from all the... Meanwhile, knowledge is going on doubling. It doubled by 67 and again by 73, by which point we were up to 256 J which meant that somebody in 1973 could, if they had the resources, the time, and enough methamphetamine and never slept, they could find 256 bits of information for every one available to the most knowledgeable person in one AD, or twice as much as were available in 1967, <coughs> only six years earlier. It's doubling even faster now. It got up to a doubling every year, and now it's doubling faster than every year, which means the world is changing more and more rapidly, <coughs> which either means we're all going to go smash and all the doomsday prophets can say, see, we warned you, or we're going to break through to levels we've never achieved before and live in a world more wonderful than any utopia we could imagine, or we're going to have a little bit of both. <laughs> Well, we're certainly on an accelerating curve and it's accelerating faster all the time. I happen to be on the side of the optimists for various reasons. One is most of the literary world is on the side of the pessimists. I think somebody's got to speak. Just so we can have a dialogue, somebody should take up the other side. The second reason is a lot of research on longevity shows that optimists outlive pessimists. <laughs> optimists live on the average 19% longer than pessimists. So why the hell do I want to kill myself any sooner by becoming a pessimist? <laughs> the third thing is that optimism is a lot of fun and pessimism is a fucking drag. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm an optimist by, by profession. So I think we are heading towards an absolute transcendence of previous humanity. Space migration will allow us to try to walk among the stars, to try to go, to boldly go where no critter has gone before. <laughs> I never say Congress person or clergy person because I know the animal rights people are gaining in power all the time and eventually <laughs> that's going to become as taboo as spokesman. So I'm trying to keep ahead of the mob by saying spokes critter and congress critter. <laughs> and congress critter and so for, for the sake of the science fiction buffs, I might change it to congress entity. <laughs> uh, who knows how many little little green men we have in congress already wearing elaborate disguises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. And every child is born into a, an umwelt, a culture, an emic reality which programs their brain to receive certain signals and ignore others, which is why it's so hard for people from different cultures to understand one another and requires good effort and a lot of work on both sides before they begin to get over the idea the other guy must be nuts because he's nothing like me. 
It takes a long while. And when we begin to communicate across culture, something begins to change, and every culture grows and benefits. The timid, the conservative, the one with an infophobic imprint on the first circuit, the ones who are afraid of exotic foods and exotic ideas, etc., they put up the longest trouble and kick and scream and fight against it. But the world has been steadily growing more and more cosmopolitan. All the uh, hullabaloo against globalization, they pick the wrong word. Globalization it has to happen, it's been happening, and it's happening faster all the time, like the flow of information. The question is, will it be controlled from the top up by a bunch of billionaires, or will it be controlled from the bottom up through grassroots decentralization? That's the real issue. Global God or revolution or, or blind chance somehow arranged the 92 chemical elements at random around this planet so that in order to make the most intelligent use of what we've got, the building blocks we got to work with, we need international cooperation, which can only be achieved in two ways. If one country conquers and dominates the rest of the world, or if we all agree to give up that game because it's getting more and more, to quote Bucky Fuller, omni-lethal. <laughs> It's, it's getting more and more dangerous to play imperialist politics. And uh, we may eventually have to learn to negotiate with one another and, and make all that effort of learning to appreciate other cultures. And so I think Internet is the most revolutionary force in the world because as more and more countries come online, we get more and more different viewpoints. Uh, the child is absorbing his own culture, her own culture, and not learning much about any other culture. Now, if you want to be a success as a teacher, the first rule you learn is don't try to teach them anything. Uh, recite the tribal catechism, but don't try to teach them anything, anything else that might stimulate them or get them uh, intellectually excited or rambunctious. Above all, don't encourage any thought on their part. The major function of public education is to teach memorization and to prevent thought. There's one correct answer, you copy it in your book, you memorize it, you regurgitate it on the examination and you get promoted. If you can regurgitate enough of the bits of information they've given you, you get a high mark and you, be, you get a gold star and your parents are proud of you, etc. Intelligence and creativity and thought are nowhere encouraged because they lead to uh, conflicts with the power structure. And then suddenly we hit adolescence and the DNA sends out the messenger RNA and another mutation that occurs we develop a fourth circuit in our brains, which Leary calls the socio-sexual circuit. You all remember when that circuit turned on. Everything <laughs> you had learned up until then seemed unimportant. There was, only, there was only one question, where do I get laid? And the second question, how do I get laid? And then. Well, and then wh what happens after I get laid? <laughs> How do you avoid all the terrible things society tells me will happen once you get laid? How do you avoid pregnancy, VD, and uh, the cops? Well, <laughs> <coughs> uh, this could almost be called the guilt circuit, but this, this gradually forms what Freud called the superego. But it's, it builds directly out of the sexual energy because throughout most of human history, well, now we get into it. No, I don't want to get off into that damn digression. Let's just say, within the parameters of a rather repressive system that started in the, the Bronze Age, there was enough sanity that they married their kids off as soon as they reached puberty. And they had no problem with teenage pregnancy. Because it's, not, it's obvious, you see, with any animal, when the sexual apparatus turns into turns on, that's when they start to mate. As the same should be true of humans, unless you happen to believe we're not animals. You happen to believe we were created by somebody with a long white beard sitting on a cloud a few feet up and keeping track of who's masturbating so he can send them to hell to burn for holy <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, the evidence seems to indicate that we're animals, so naturally we, when we go reach that season, we should start mating. Our society gave up that idea when it seemed we needed longer educations to hypnotize us, brainwash us, and prepare us for our slots in the corporate hierarchy, depending on which imprints we took. We end up doing the manual labor, or we end up doing the middle rank, or we end up on top fighting almost with like 
gang fights with knives and alleys with the other top people at the top to see who can get higher. The main rule is whoever dies with the most toys is the winner for that generation. But of course, there are always others fighting over because there's new toys being created and there's always more toys to get. Uh, this is what's known as capitalist, uh, by, as the free marketplace. Wilhelm Reich in the mass psychology of fascism pointed out that without a great deal of sexual repression, the working class would have rebelled a long time ago. What keeps the working class slogging along and taking all the abuse that they take and being robbed every way the bandits on the top can think of robbing them is the fact they are so sexually miserable that they spend all their time persecuting people who seem to be having a good time sexually, <laughs> hunting them down, throwing them in jail, and worrying about darn foreigners and others who might be a threat to what the little that they've got. And now they've got even more to worry about since the corporations have become multinational and they're abolishing jobs every day and more jobs are going to slave labor in the Orient and more people are out of work. And what keeps all this going is that most people are so goddamn miserable in their sex lives and so goddamn angry, and they know if they express their anger, they're going to land in the nut house or in prison. And if they try to express their sexuality, they're not only hemmed in by the old damn society. On one side, they're hemmed in by part of the radical movement because anything they do might turn out to be politically incorrect, God forbid. So between moral, being morally incorrect and being politically incorrect, it's better off if you were born a eunuch. I'm sorry, but if you weren't, well, you just stuck with it. Deal with it as best, best you can. I'm not here to solve your problems. I'm just here to help you identify them. <laughs> <laughs> the fifth circuit in Leary's system, the neurosomatic circuit, is turned on immediately by entering zero gravity. Eighty, around an average of 85 percent of all the Russian cosmonauts and American astronauts, everybody who's gone into zero gravity is turned on the neurosomatic circuit. Edgar Mitchell was quoted as saying, "I can't tell you how beautiful it was. It was so incredibly beautiful. My whole life changed when I saw that beauty." And he wasn't talking about Marilyn Monroe. He was talking about the planet Earth. This piece of shit we walk around on and abuse and never think about. Suddenly it was radiantly beautiful to him. Uh, yoga exercises will turn on the neurosomatic circuit. So will the brainwave machines like the ones that Joe was demonstrating in the other room earlier. For most people in the United States at present, the neurosomatic circuit has been turned on by marijuana. If you want to know why the government is still at war with marijuana and they've got no evidence whatsoever to justify a war against such a beneficial and harmless substance, it's because the whole system depends on the misery of the masses. If the masses start getting happy, the next thing is they start getting uppity and rambunctious and God knows what might happen, the whole system might fall apart. The last czar, Czar McCaffrey, he gave a long speech, which I quoted. Did anybody see my article in the March High Times? Nobody here reads? Oh, somebody did. Hey, thank you, thank you. I, I, it wasn't just like burying it in my backyard. Uh, publishing in High Times, you do reach an audience, but it's a select audience. <laughs> Well, I quoted a long speech by McCaffrey about the importance of faith-based organizations. He goes on and on for three long paragraphs about faith-based organizations. We need more faith, but the government should support faith. This was all before Bush got elected. I wrote this back early, about uh, last, oct last October, maybe even September. I picked up on that because I was examining the thesis that the United States has become a czarist-occupied government. We not only have an official czar, we've got secret police spying on everybody. We even got the piss police who come in and test your urine. Even <laughs> the worst czar has never thought of that. The worst satires of Kafka and George Orwell did not include the piss police. And yet we've got it, and the masses are enduring it in their general misery. It's just one more humiliation they got to put up with. And the czar is going on and on about faith-based organizations, and I realized 
My God, that's the one feature of czarism we don't have, is the church is working for the government and spying on everybody else and making reports. That was one of the chief reasons the, that all, not just the communists, but all the radicals in Russia, part of their platform was the abolition of the Christian religion, because Eastern Orthodox religion was a tool of the czarists for centuries. They were spies for the government, among other things, and brainwashers for the government. So now we've got a czar, we've got a secret police spying on everything we do, and now they're urging government funds for faith-based organizations, and now it's not just the last czar, it's George Bush. I think they're trying to turn the, the whole goddamn religious establishment into an arm of the government to spy on all the rest of because they, they can't hire enough cops, but if they pay the church, the church would be glad to do the job for them. Um, where am I? Oh, let's see. Well, I was going to do a... Uh, I was, well, if I had time, I was going to do a little neurosomatic exercise. What the hell? You probably all, you're probably all stoned already anyway, so you don't need any fifth circuit exercises. So we will move on to the sixth circuit. What's on there? You must have missed a lot. Oh, okay. I want everybody to close your eyes and just listen to the sounds and see how many different sounds you hear. Now open your eyes. Now, what did you hear? Conversation outside the door. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Breathing. Breathing. Uh, flame Hold behind on. you in the fireplace. Uh -huh. um, Air vents. <laughs> okay. What did you hear? What did you hear? You. Mm -hmm. I heard myself hearing. Yeah. You heard yourself hearing. You hear yourself thinking? No. No. <laughs> okay. Now, how long was that experience? Uh, well, how. Uh, Speak, speak loudly and clearly and one at a time. 30 seconds. 32 seconds. 42 seconds. 42 seconds. <laughs> a minute. A minute. 32 seconds. 32 seconds. Time, timeless, because I was hearing inner sound and there was no barrier, so there was no time. Timeless, 20, 27 <laughs> seconds. 20 seconds. A minute. A half a minute. We have a clustering around half a minute with a few seconds. Anybody want to say two minutes? A minute and a half. <coughs> okay, the, the, it runs from 27 seconds to a minute with clustering around 30 seconds. You see, you're all in your own universe all the time with you. Who is the master who makes the grass green? You, you, you know what your nervous system knows, and it's never the same thing that somebody else's nervous system knows. Now, close your eyes again and don't put any words on the sounds. Just hit, if you think of the word, push it away and just concentrate <coughs> on the sound. Push away thoughts. Just hear sounds. Now, 
Does anybody starting to feel a little bit high or spacey? Hold up your arm. <coughs> anybody begin to keep your arms up. Anybody begin to feel feel it now? You feel a little bit more tranquil than before this exercise. Keep your arms up, please. Now open your eyes and look around. <laughs> Hey, you don't have to wait till you're senile. Here's a way to get high in space down. The government can't take it away from you. Just pay, pay close attention to the sounds in the room. And remember that everybody else is hearing different sounds than you. So there's as many sounds as there are people in the room. That was a mild neurosomatic experience for more advanced where I consult the local crass dealer. I think there are about 12, <laughs> there are at least 12 of them at this. Uh, <laughs> uh, the neurogenetic circuit is when the, uh, the RNA begins to read the DNA directly and pass messages on to us. Jung called this the collective unconscious, but it's not really unconscious. It it can become conscious, and it frequently does. This is the origin of religion, magic, shamanism, and it's usually associated with psychedelics. There are about 150 psychedelics involved in the evolution of religion in Europe and Asia, and 1,500 in the evolution of North and South America. For some reason, this hemisphere has a lot more psychoactive vegetables than the old, than the other than the other hemisphere does, or the American uh, Indian shamans were much more curious and experimental. And maybe they, maybe they were more conservative in Europe. Well, if this works, we'll stick with it. We won't try any other alternatives. I don't know. But the neurogenetic circuit is encounters with um, devilish and evil shadow side and with great gods and goddesses and animal allies and uh, it's 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 like the puka and and uh, in, in carry in other parts of Ireland there's a, an old legend that goes right back to the Stone Age it's been there through all the conquest. Ireland is the most conquered country in the world. It's been invaded by one group after another. Them, every everybody but the Merovingians, the the, the Formorians, the Milesians, the Greeks, the Spanish, the Norse, the Normans, the English. And there's a lot of evidence of African inhabitants of Ireland in early days, too, in a book by Bob Quinn called Atlanta, Atlantean. Um, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. okay. The puka inhabits neighborhoods in the vicinity of pubs. <laughs> Irish pubs close at 11.30. Frequently on their way home from the pub, farmers find themselves snatched by the puka, who looks like a six-foot-tall white rabbit. <laughs> and he grabs them and he says, got your arse, mate, and he drags them off into parallel universes. <laughs> <laughs> have adventures with Finn McCool and Deirdre of the Sorrows and Grania the Fair and Isolde the Fair and King Mark and Cahoolan and all the great heroes of Celtic epics and Shiva and Krishna and Arjuna and uh, Mohammed and Hercules and Aphrodite and Darth Vader and the Shadow <laughs> and, and Hannibal Lecter and the Frankenstein monster. And this goes on for billions and billions of years of fantasy and excitement and ecstasy and horror. And when the book is bored and tired playing with you, he puts you back on the road and it's only two minutes later in ordinary time. Now some say the probability of meeting the puka is directly proportional to how many pints of Guinness you've had in the pub. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. <clears throat> well, people have had neurogenetic experiences throughout history. And uh, one way of, account of, of accounting for them is the extraterrestrial theory. Somewhere in a galaxy far, far away, 
these little gray buggers get into some pretty vicious chemicals, some pretty vicious compounds, and when they're all tripping their brains out and totally irresponsible, and I mean, I'm talking about really vicious stuff like belladonna or gypsum weed, only something even worse from their home planet. <laughs> Suddenly, when they're all off their skulls, one of them says, Hey, let's get in the flying saucer and go 80 billion light years and have another go at Whitley Strieber's ass. Well, that's the most popular theory right now. <laughs> then there's uh, Rupert Sheldrake's morphogenetic field, which carries information from one species to another, and some of it coming from species pretty far from us on the evolutionary tree would be pretty weird when we first encountered it. And then there's Carl Jung's theory that in translating from the genetic code into the consciousness, these symbols are spontaneously created to, to represent various types of gene packets and imprint packets, and you don't call them the archetypes. Uh, Leary just calls this uh, neurogenetic circuit experience, and he says if you pay close enough attention on us uh, with the right type of uh, neurogenetic experience, you can get not only the whole history of the planet, you get the future too. And you can see why people go into uh, the neurosomatic circuit in free fall, because we're preparing for a mutation in which we'll all be neurosomatic beings after we migrate off the home planet and begin investigating the rest of the universe. And the uh, visions of extreme longevity, the Methuselah, Rip Van Winkle type legends and, <coughs> and their variants. This is all predicting the fact that with, with modern biotech research going as it is, pretty soon we're going to have extreme longevity and eventually we'll have immortality. And uh, so, or as Barbara Marx Hubbard of the Royal Future Society says, mystical experiences are simply memories of the future. <laughs> this is what we're all evolving towards. Some of us get more flashes of it more often. Some of us never get any flashes of it at all and spend all the time worrying about our bank accounts. <laughs> uh, bank accounts are very important because they contain the computer notations. The computer notations refer to pieces of paper. The pieces of paper are printed by the Federal Reserve. These are very valuable. <laughs> because the Federal Reserve has a magic wand which it waves over them, and this makes them money, M-O-N-E-Y, which is the most valuable commodity in the world. And uh, as Thomas Harris points out in Hannibal, even the United States has given up on Jehovah and is now worshiping mammon. Money. And the reason this is real money is because of the magic wand. If the Mafia or the Crips, or you and me, or a bunch of our friends, and we went down to sell them and printed it, and it looked exactly like it, it was made out of exactly the same kind of, it wouldn't be money, because we don't have the magic wand. <laughs> that belongs only to the board of directors of the Federal Reserve. And I, if you don't believe me, you get any book that tries to explain the Federal Reserve and see if you can come up with a more plausible theory than the one I just gave <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, the neurogenetic thing is what magic is all about. You've been having a lot of neurogenetic experiences or intimations of neurogenetic experiences this weekend. So we press on to the metaprogramming circuit, which is activated by very advanced yogas, a lot of experience with the neurogenetic circuit. And uh, adeptship in the fi and alchemy, especially the mystic element, pound, shillings, pence which has the initial L, initials LSD. About this, as Crowley said, it is unlawful to speak to the uninitiate. <laughs> but those who know, those who seek shall find, and those who do not seek shall end up in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> is a word invented by John Lilly, which I inserted into Leary's system, and Leary liked it so much he put it into the later editions of his books. Metaprogramming consists of changing the imprints on all the circuits there that you can change, and you learn how to do this as you experiment with shifting reality tunnels by using your ability for neurological 
re-imprinting by entering reality tunnels that were forbidden to you before, which sounds impossible except when you're on acid and they're playing the introduction to how those frocks are at Oh yeah, I could do that, yeah. <laughs> and finally there's the non-local quantum circuit which people turn on when they're dying. And even if they don't die, if, if the doctors or something or other pulls them back, they all have vague memories of it. It's an experience of entering a white light that extends to infinity in all directions. That's at least that's one of the symptoms of it. It has a sense of completeness and knowingness about it. And uh, according to uh, Tim's writings as interpreted by a bunch of physicists I know, especially Saul Paul Sirag, and reinterpreted by me. Uh, this is just uh, from within the atomic structure that we, that we are all made out of. Uh, on the quantum level, everything is non-locally correlated, so we are all <coughs> one thing. The mystics have been saying it for thousands of years, but John S. Bell wrote the equations that prove that if quantum mechanics is true, then this is also true. Everything is connected. Of course, some things are more connected than others, but uh, the, um, the sense of the interconnectedness of all things, no matter how many people preach it at you, no matter how many books they write about it, and how many trees they, they spike, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference until you've had the experience yourself and then it changes your whole life. And it also, I know some physicists who do acid only once a year when they want to reconsider Bell's theorem and its implications. <laughs> <laughs> because Bell's, Bell's theorem has pretty much won out in the experimental uh, <coughs> area. The experiments that seem to refute it have been shown to be defective, and the experiments that support it under stricter and stricter controls continue to support it. So it's, it contradicts relativity, but that's nothing new in science. Newton's model of the universe lasted 300 years. With the acceleration of knowledge, we couldn't expect Einstein's model to last that long. So. Some cracks are appearing in special relativity. It seems there's faster than light communication between me and everything else in the universe. And that means space, the whole space-time continuum, the past, present, and the future. So if I sound a bit confused at times, it's because I'm trying to deal with all this cosmic stuff, all this cosmic shit coming in from all directions. <laughs> it's a little bit weird sometimes. And I think we've got enough time left for one or two or three questions. I got you through the whole eight circuits, and I only gave you one exercise, but you got the general flavor of the system. Yes? I, you mentioned earlier about the faith based initiatives. I happen to see in the paper today that uh, Gary Falwell is now expressing some reservations about it because he's realized that it's going to apply to all the other faiths out there. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday, Pat Robertson had opinions on it. Oh really? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, they want to be. They want. He doesn't believe in mixing church and state because it's not necessarily his church. His church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's worried about money going to Scientologists, the Hare Krishnas, and what was the third group? Well, just imagine if they turn, you know, they're turning, Bush's plan is to turn more and more government over to faith-based organizations. So, they, how about capital punishment? That's perpetually controversial. Let the faith-based organizations do it because they have faith in what, in what they're doing, you know? So the Catholics could burn, you know, they could all bid on each execution. And, and, you know, in different states, depending on, you know, in some states there are more Catholics, in some states there are more Protestants, etc. Some states have more Jews and so on. Some have a lot of Muslims. And whoever puts in the winning bed or the first bid or whatever it is, the Catholics get to burn them to death, the Protestants get to hang them, the Orthodox Jews and Muslims get to stone them to death, the Sikhs get to chop off their heads again, and America would really look like a strange new, a brave new world indeed. <laughs> and, these, and these religious people would be, all be glad to do it because it's all in their sacred books. I wrote Bush a letter about this, and I got a nice answer from the White House saying, thank you for your opinions. <laughs> 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 but 
which is just the first. I'm going to send Bush a letter every couple of weeks. I'm going to print them all on my website under the title of the Wilson Bush Correspondence. <laughs> yes? Have you ever had a look at your FBI file? No. You have one? Well, I presume so. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Yeah. I don't know. They seem to be Oh, yes. What do you think Leary will most be remembered for? What will Leary be most? Gee, that's a hard one. I think, well, to tell you the God's honest truth, I believe that LSD can change consciousness and behavior more than anything else known in the history of psychology to this day. I think if the Inquisition was ended and free scientific inquiry was allowed, Leary would be totally vindicated on that point. Other types of therapy would be used only as adjuncts or, or crutches to help you over the hard parts, but LSD would be the major type of therapy. They cured damn near everything. And they'd all find themselves out of work. Maybe that's why nobody wants to end the Inquisition and do the research. But while the research was legal, LSD cured all sorts of things in all sorts of small trial groups. There's hardly anything you can think of that LSD didn't cure or vastly help. And then the government decided it was a menace. And the, the, the Catholic Inquisition ended in 1819. And then the world, apparently, nature abhors a vacuum, so the United States government created its own inquisition in 1965. Thou shalt not do research in the following areas, and they add a little bit to it every year. Um, that's, a, that's a glum note to end on. Give me a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he, your hand was up first. Um, do you think with each new uh, drug that comes out, that there's going to be a new sort of when all, of, when all of society goes through a paradigm shift at once, do we have to burn history of the past in order to go over that hump? Is it required at every every one of these junctions? It do we have to what? History burn of the history. Burn? Yeah. We, we burned the last history when we made a, a major social jump of some type from, you know, there was from nature-based religions into organized religions. Most yeah. history was destroyed or rewritten. Uh, no, I don't think that. I think in the major jumps in the last 2,000 years, we've preserved more and more of history. So I think the jumps involve a greater, a greater knowledge of history, just like a greater knowledge of everything in general. We certainly know a lot more history than the people who wrote the Bible who thought the world began in 404 B.C. with two people put in a garden with a baited trap and told, don't go near that bait there. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, one psychedelic that's been getting a lot of attention over the past, I guess, 10 years or so through Terrence McKenna is DMT, a methyl tryptamine. Yeah. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> a lot of people do, a lot of people don't. This is strictly a matter of uh, individual Biochemical Individuality. There's a book called Biochemical Individuality, and among other things, it proves cell by cell and atom by atom we're all different. But it also, one of the most unforgettable mnemonics for that idea is in, I think, the very first chapter of that book. It has five human stomachs removed from cadavers, and they're all different. They all look wildly different from each other. And then on the facing page is the human stomach from a medical textbook. And it doesn't look like any of the real stomachs. <laughs> just remember that. You you are one of the real stomachs. You are not the illustration. <laughs> my stomach, my stomach. Uh, okay, that's all. Good. Thank you.